science is not in, in principle committed to the idea that there's no afterlife or that the, the mind is identical to the brain right. or that materialism is true. Science is completely open to whatever in fact is true. And if it's true that the consciousness is being run like software on the brain and can, by virtue of ectoplasm or something else we don't understand, can be dissociated from the brain at death, that would be part of our growing scientific understanding of the world if we could discover it. Now, uh, and there's, there are ways we could in fact discover that if it were true. The problem is there are very good reasons to think it's not true. And we know this from now 150 years of neurology where you damage areas of the brain and faculties are lost. And they're clearly, it's not that everyone with brain damage is perf has their soul perfectly intact, they just can't get the words out. This is, the, you, everything about your mind can be damaged by damaging the brain. You can cease to recognize faces, you can cease to know the names of animals, but you still know the names of tools. I mean, the, 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 the fragmentation in, in, in the way in which our, our mind is parcellated at the level of the brain is not at all intuitive, and, had, and there's a lot known about it. And what we're being asked to consider is that you damage one part of the brain and the mind something about the mind and, and, and subjectivity is lost. You damage another and, and, and yet more is lost. And yet if you damage the whole thing at death, we can rise off the brain with all our faculties intact, recognizing grandma and speaking English. Now, Many people think that um, based on, I don't, I don't know if it was George Bernard Shaw or Mark Twain, or I think they both alternately been credited with this quote, but you, you can't reason out of, you can't reason somebody out of something they weren't reasoned into. But you've uh, practiced it a yeah, lot. Yeah, but that, that's just false. I mean, you, you, you can reason people out of their deeply held beliefs that they didn't reason themselves into, but they're just, you know, just acquired with mother's milk, uh, or they've reasoned themselves into, and they can reason themselves out of it, and, you know, just based on some continued conversation. Uh, and do you do that with questions, or you do that with stubbornness? Well, you, you, you do it in you do it by continuing the conversation, and you and as long as I mean, this is the the crucial matter for me is, can we talk about it? You know, there are certain people who are saying, listen, we can't talk about it. You know, if you say X, Y, and Z, I'm just going to come and kill you, right? That's the that's the really clear line between the 21st century and, and, and the 14th century, right? And we have to just, we have to hold that line and there are many, many liberals, far too many liberals on this campus and every other and in every journal like, you know, but the, with, with prime offenders like The Guardian and The Nation and um, uh, Salon, I mean, the, the, the people who will just, who are just giving away our freedoms with both hands, uh, desperate to do it and will condemn as a bigot anyone who who complains, and that's a, so we have a we have a battle for civilization right here that has nothing to do with with uh, suicide bombers. It has to do with with people just, just totally losing the plot ethically and politically okay. um, and intellectually. But yeah, it's just it, you have to keep putting pressure on on uh, bad ideas because that's that's the thing about bad ideas they they don't they don't respond well to pressure. They don't, they're, they're, people have internal contradictions uh, in their lives that they uh, can notice uh, because they're, you know, do you, do you think prayer works? Many people say, yes, absolutely, I think prayer works. And, I, and then you say, okay, well, you know, we have a new airline where the, the pilots are just gonna rely on prayer to land the planes. Uh, ticket, tickets will be cheap and, you know, you can Very cheap. You know, sign up, you know. Um, Who's going to sign up for that airline? If, you, if, you, if, if the pilot comes over the PA system and tells you that he's convinced that prayer is all he needs to land this plane, you know, you're, you're just going to see just stark terror on the faces of even the most religious people. Uh, and so that's a, that's a contradiction that can be pointed out. Uh, and there are, uh, we have to do that a thousand fold uh, and just keep doing it. But as you say, you know, global warming, evolution, these are, these are the jury's not out on questions, and many people just don't subscribe, and that's just, it's a failure of conversation, ultimately. Atheism is really a term we do not need. I mean, it, in the same way that we don't have a word for someone who's not an astrologer. You know, no, 
you know, we don't have websites for non-astrologers. There are no groups for non-astrologers. Nobody wakes up in the morning feeling the need to remind himself that he's not an astrologer. The irony is that atheism is completely without content. It is not a philosophical position. And all religious people are atheists with respect to everyone else's religion. I mean, we're all atheists with respect to the thousands of dead gods who lie in that mass grave we call mythology. I mean, think of Thor and Isis and Zeus. You know, they, they, these were once gods in good standing among our ancestors. But the, more importantly, every Christian rejects the claims of Islam, just as I do. You know, Muslims claim that they have the perfect word of the creator of the universe. Why do they believe this? Because it says so in the book. Sorry, not good enough. So, so th this term atheism really is misleading. We're talking about specific truth claims and their evidence, or lack thereof. The atheist is simply saying, as Carl Sagan did, that extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. If ever there were an antidote to dogmatism, this is it. Okay, if you're going to say that, that non-locality is, is, is an operable principle in neuroscience, that is woo-woo right now it's in not. neuroscience. It's that, a that is their principle in morphogenesis and differentiation. It's a principle in the workings of the pacemaker of your heart, where a hundred pacemaker not, cells it's fire not simultaneously, non-locally. Saying it louder and, and relentlessly is not going to make it true. <laughs> uh, there, there's a related claim that atheists and scientists generally are arrogant. Now, I, this is rather ironic. The, the truth is, is that when scientists don't know something, like why the universe came into being or how the first self-replicating molecules formed on Earth, they tend to admit it. Pretending to know things you do not know is a profound liability in science. You get punished for this rather quickly. But pretending to know things you do not know is the lifeblood of faith-based religion. Any, uh, this is really one of the profound ironies of religious discourse in the, the frequency with, with which you can hear religious people praise themselves for their humility <laughs> while tacitly claiming to know things about cosmology and physics and chemistry and paleontology that no scientist knows. I mean, any, any person who, who dignifies Genesis as an account of creation or as, even as, as informative, is essentially saying to someone like Stephen Hawking, Stephen, you're a smart guy, and, and uh, you know, I see you got a lot, a lot of equations over there, but you don't know enough about cosmology. You know, it says here that, 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 that God did this in six days and then rested on the seventh, and I don't see how you've really grappled with the, the nuances of the biblical account. Uh, th this would be amusing if it were not having such a disastrous effect upon our public policy. It, it, it is impeding medical research and the teaching of science in this country. 30% of te biology teachers in the United States at the high school level don't even mention evolution because of the, the, ha to, because of the hassle occasioned by the, just the, the religious hysteria that it provokes in their students and their students' parents. You all remember the, the recent presidential debate where three Republican candidates for the, the presidency solemnly raised their hands to testify that they don't believe in evolution. And there was no, there was no follow-up question. I mean, this is embarrassing. And it seems like every few months the opinion page of the New York Times publishes another defense of this kind of ignorance. There's no question that this is eroding our stature in the eyes of the rest of the developed world. Many people claim to find it impossible to believe or to imagine that they won't exist after death. Um, just try it for a second. I mean, you, you imagine that everyone in Paris right now is getting along fine without all of us. I mean, none of us are in Paris. We are really, really materially absent from whatever is going on in every other city on this planet right now. Mm -hmm. uh, you were absent for all of human history before your birth. Uh, the idea that you, that you simply can't imagine not existing after death is really kind of a, just for lack of trying, I think. <laughs>
The deeper point here, and this is where the whole style and content of what you're saying is so deeply unscientific, is that there's not a, there's not a physicist sitting on this stage right now. Okay, I would never be tempted to lecture a room full of a thousand people at Caltech about physics. I'm not a physicist. You're not a physicist. And, and, and basically every sentence demonstrates that, that you speak on the subject. Now, now and despite what, what Christians say on the subject, the New Testament isn't so good as to make the Bible a reliable basis of morality. In fact, much of the book is an embarrassment to anyone who would say it is a moral book, much less a perfectly moral book. And nowhere is this clearer than on the question of slavery. And the truth is, the Bible in its totality, Old Testament, New Testament, supports slavery. If we recognize anything, if we, if, if we converge on any point in ethical terms now, it's that slavery is evil. Nowhere in the Bible is this evil recognized, much less repudiated. The slaveholders of the South were on the winning side of a theological argument. They knew it. They never stopped talking about it. The best God does in, in the Old Testament is to admonish us not to beat our slaves so badly that we injure their eyes or their teeth, or, or not to beat them so badly with a rod that they die on the spot. If they die after a day or two, no problem. I think it should go without saying that this is not the kind of moral insight that got rid of slavery in the United States. It's true that some people define God as pure consciousness or as being synonymous with the laws of nature. Uh, but if we talk about consciousness and the laws of nature, we won't be talking about the God that most of our neighbors believe in, which is a personal God who hears our prayers and occasionally answers them. So I just want you to be sensitive to this, because if Michael or I say something derogatory about Islam or Christianity, which seems possible, uh, <laughs> The response from the other side shouldn't mention quantum mechanics. And, and, it, and it shouldn't reference a, a, a notion of God that is so denuded of doctrine as to more or less be synonymous with pure mystery or pure information or pure energy or pure anything. Um, so I just wanna, I wanted to plant a flag there where you all can see it. Because the God that our neighbors believe in is essentially an invisible person he is a creator deity who created the universe to have a relationship with one species of primate. Lucky us. <laughs> and and he's, got, he's got galaxy upon galaxy to attend to, but he's especially concerned with what we do, and, and he's especially concerned with what we do while naked. <laughs> He almost certainly disapproves of homosexuality. And he's created this, this cosmos as a vast laboratory in which to test our powers of credulity. And the test is this. Can you believe in this God on bad evidence? Which is to say on faith. And, and if you can, you will win an eternity of happiness after you die. And it's precisely this sort of God and this sort of scheme that you must believe in if you're going to have a, a, any kind of future in politics in this country. A, no matter what's your gifts, I mean, you could be, you could be an, an unprecedented genius, you could look like George Clooney, you could have a billion dollars, and you could have the social skills of Oprah, and you are going nowhere in politics in this country unless you believe in that sort of God. People uh, can't seem to see that one, that we're talking about ideas and their consequences. And everything we say about Islam or Islamism or jihadism, or depending on what the focus is, conservative Islam, is, applies to white converts to the faith and it applies to people in a hundred different countries who, and of a wide variety of ethnicities. Um, if ever I say something disparaging about Islam compared to Hinduism or Buddhism, well then that has nothing to do with racism or the colors of, of people's skin. I mean, this is, so racism and bigotry against people based on ethnicity or the country of their birth, that has nothing to do with, any, with, with uh, this conversation at all. And so this, this meme of Islamophobia that has been thrown up to prevent conversations of this kind is really quite destructive. Uh, and it's something that 
I mean, the, the hypocrisy here should be just shattering to liberals in particular, because you have, uh, as Maja just said, we are abandoning the women and the free thinkers and the gays and the public intellectuals and the apostates in uh, these are the most vulnerable people on earth in Muslim societies where you have you know, atheist bloggers, or not even atheist bloggers, just secular bloggers. People at Rafe, by the way. Getting hacked yeah. to death. You know, um, uh, and liberals are not, not only not giving them any tools by which to better their lives, they are castigating the people who are trying to shine a light on this, the disproportionate nature of the problem here. It, you, to be gay or even a woman in a country like Afghanistan or Saudi Arabia or Bangladesh. I mean, these, are, these, are, these are unlucky places to be in, in a, uh, a minority of that kind. Um, uh, and so it's a, uh, uh, as we argue at some length in the book, liberalism has really failed us here. Uh, and it's not, and you can, you can criticize Christianity all you want, and liberals will never bat an eye. You can criticize Mormonism all you want, and, uh, but the, um, the moment you try to shine a light on the problem of, I think, you know, appropriately described as Islamism for, the, for this conversation, uh, just the, um, uh, the full armamentarium of political correctness and, and um, uh, cries of racism just hits you full in the face. And, it's just, it is a thankless job. Nobody wants to do this. Nobody wants to have this conversation because it is so poisonous. So it seems to me that certain moral intuitions begin to relax once you take this picture of scientific causality on board. When you, when you have to admit that even the most terrifying people are at some basic level unlucky to be who they are. The, the, the logic of, of hating them as opposed to fearing them and, and, and restraining them begins to break down. And once again, this is, this is true even if you believe that every human being harbors a soul. That to be born with the soul of a psychopath is to be unlucky. So, so one consequence of this view, or so I suggest, is that it reduces hatred. It actually, in my view, completely undercuts the logic of hatred. It, it also increases empathy and compassion. It, Take an example, which I'm, uh, I should probably get a new example, but the example of, the, of the, the worst person who's ever lived, in my mind, at the moment, is Uday Hussein. He's not objectively the worst, but he's, he's about as, the, the, as odious a person as I can think of. Uh, he was one of Saddam's eldest sons. He used to, when he would see a wedding in progress in Baghdad, he would descend with, with his thugs and, and rape the bride, just for the fun of it. Sometimes he would torture and kill the, the bride. He did this more than once. Uh, whatever you think about the ethics of the war in Iraq, it seems to me pretty obvious that, that given that we couldn't capture him and stop him from doing these things, it was good that we killed him. I mean, unless you are a total pacifist, it seems to me that this is, you have to admit, this is what guns are for, <laughs> to, to shoot people like Uday Hussein. But, but simply walk back the, the timeline of his life. Imagine him as a four-year-old boy. He could have been a, a, a creepy little boy, no doubt. It's quite possible there are child psychopaths. But he was also a very unlucky one. I mean, he, he had Saddam Hussein as a father. <laughs> How unlucky can you get? He was, he was the four-year-old boy who was going to become the psychopath Uday Hussein through no fault of his own. Now, and, and if we could have intervened at any point there, at four, at five, at six, at seven, that would have been the right thing to do, and, and compassion would have been the right motive. When would compassion stop being the right motive? Would it, would it be wrong to feel compassion for the, the 18-year-old Uday Hussein? I don't think so. He's, he's just as unlucky as the four-year-old. So, so ironically, this, if you want to be like Jesus and love your enemies, or at least not hate them. This is a, a, a doorway into compassion for even the worst people who have ever lived, a, a, a taking a, a wider picture of, of scientific causality into view. Now, one thing, one caveat is that this is not to say that this would be an